Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the workshop. We're just waiting for a few more people as they sort of trickle in. Um, but I will get started. Um, this is the B2C2 workshop, Getting and uh, Keeping Staff. And uh, we have several speakers today. So I'm going to slowly introduce them or quickly introduce them and then go through the uh, land acknowledgement. In fact, I'm gonna go through the land acknowledgement first and then I'll introduce people. So, um, and then we'll have them speak and there'll be a chance to ask questions at the end. If you do have questions while people are speaking, please feel free to put them in the chat um, and uh, we will try, people will try and get to them. Okay. Uh, so B2C2 recognizes that its work and the work of its community partners takes place on traditional Indigenous territories across the province. We acknowledge that there are 46 treaties and other agreements, including unceded land, that cover the territory now called Ontario. We are thankful to be able to work and live in these territories. We are thankful to the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial and who continue to contribute to the strength of Ontario and to all communities across the province. B2C2 is honored to collaborate with Indigenous childcare providers, families, and communities throughout the various territories. B2C2 also respects the calls for action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their significance to early childhood education and policy. We share respect for the rights of and Canada's obligations to Indigenous peoples. So um, I'm going to start at my top left. Uh, we have Jenny Cullen, who is an RECE at HR Link. Uh, she works for Compass uh, Early Learning and Childcare. And next to her is Sheila um, Olin McLean, who is um, the Compass CEO and has 40 years of experience in childcare. Then we have Ryan Heath, who is um, the been in HR at Compass for five years, or has been working for Compass for five years and in HR for four. Uh, and then we have Alana Powell, who is the executive director of the AECEO. Um, and then we have Sue Colley, who has been working in childcare uh, advocacy for 48 years and is the chair and co founder of B2C2, Building Blocks for Childcare. Um, so I'm going to leave it over to you. I'm not sure who's first or if you even worked out who's first, uh, but I'll let you go and start. There we go. Thank you, everyone, for coming to um, to this workshop about attracting and retaining staff. We're um, really happy to share our experience at Compass Early Learning and Care and how um, the some of the lessons that we've learned and some of the things that uh, we have found um, helpful in our journey as an early learning and childcare uh, team. Um, so welcome. And uh, these, you know, the things that, that we're going to share today may work for you. We hope that they will inspire you to think about, you know, what's possible in your, in your programs. Um, but it's not a, it's not a right or wrong kind of of uh, area as we think about it. Um, your teams, uh, the people that you work with uh, will uh, inspire you as well. And so bringing back some ideas or things that you can think about uh, with your teams, that's going to be important. Um, uh, hopefully an important outcome of this, of this meeting. Okay, we already introduced ourselves here, so I'll skip ahead. Um, I'm going to start with going through recruitment and specifically strategies that have worked for us at Compass. Like Sheila said, um, they might not work for everyone, but this is what we have found um, support us with, with onboarding and recruiting for new hires for educator positions. Um, so one of the first questions that I often think of with recruitment is where do we begin? Um, specifically, this is often the job posting. Um, so I've listed down a few uh, a few perspectives that we like to include in our job postings to help keep engagement up um, when we do post them out into the community spaces. Um, so the first is being personal, um, knowing the audience that you're connecting with, using language that's inviting and welcoming, 
um, highlighting too that we're looking for passionate and dedicated educators in the field, um, really making that connection with the audience. Um, also sharing who you are as an organization. So we always take our job postings, we always take the opportunity in our job postings to share who we are, um, share our values, share our mission, our vision, our culture. And usually we start our job postings off with a brief snapshot of our history um, as Compass and uh, where we are today. Um, we've also used the opportunity for sharing who we are as connecting recruitment videos in our postings. Um, that's a, a newer trend that we've started to do. The reason for that is we thought, why, why can't we share um, the visual aspect as well when we're posting the words already in our postings? Um, so it gives applicants the opportunity to also see our environment, see our educators, um, see the way that they interact with children when they're looking at those postings. Um, being clear, it's really important that we lay out the expectations for the roles that we're looking for in applicants. We often use language such as accountabilities. So rather than using a, a grocery uh, shop list for, for tasks that might be needed for the role, we look for those uh, dispositions. Um, we know that skills uh, and experiences can be gained, um, but we really look for those dispositions and those value-based connections, um, including compensation and benefits. So being transparent, that's a shift that we've been doing for about four years now is including the wages rate in our postings, um, not only the starting rate, but also the wage grid, and then including the breakdown for, um, for how wages are decided, and then including the benefits piece. Um, listing our whole person compensation rate right in the job posting, um, sharing what's applicable to permanent contract or supply staff so they know when they're applying um, what they'll be able to receive as well. Um, using a JEDI lens, so that's justice, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Making sure that the posting's accessible, we share contact information for any accommodations that applicants may require. And then welcoming applicants from diverse groups. We want our staff to be their authentic selves. We want them to be celebrated for who they are. Um, so why not put that in the posting as well? So next is where to find staff. I've broken it down into five areas. Now, these are the five areas that we have found the most success. Again, they're not necessarily the best ones for everyone. Um, for us, one of the biggest ones has been community engagement. So going out to community events, uh, we've attended festivals in our local communities, uh, pride parades, markets, any chances we get to really engage in the communities where our programs are located. Uh, the second is building relationships with community partners. So we have found a lot of success with employment agencies, um, high school volunteer programs. This is a great time of year for that as well. I know a lot of, um, a lot of school districts run focus on youth which is an opportunity to bring on high school students in the summer, and they help provide for those wages. Um, and then also connecting with other resources such as the New Canadian Centre. Going off of relationships with community partners, post-secondary schools can be one of the biggest things. For recruitment, building those relationships right off the bat um, with students who we know will be going into the field. Um, we always strive to build relationships with the placement coordinators, share out contact information from our locations, so then we can start the connections right away. Um, welcoming as many placement students as you can. I know it can be tricky, especially when, when you need to have the staff in place to be able to support and mentor, but bringing on those students can be a really great opportunity as well um, to start that recruitment and hopefully have uh, job offers ready to go for when their placements are done. Um, attending post-secondary career fairs can be helpful as well, and then attending post-secondary ECE classes. We've had the chance to connect directly with the ECE programs before and go into the classes to speak directly to the students, share what career opportunities you have, share your benefits, um, share any lifelong learning or professional development opportunities that your organization may offer as well. Um, being creative, I'm going to spend a bit more time on the next slide for this one. Um, two things that I'll speak to in the next slide are virtual open houses and in-house career fairs. Um, they're, they're our take on creative, so two new things that we've tried over the last couple of years. And then the last section on here, social media and job boards. More traditional um, with job boards, especially since COVID seeing that shift to online recruitment. So really trying to engage in as many places as possible. Um, for us, we look at Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn, Indeed trying to get your name out there and also share your positions and opportunities wherever you can. Um, going back to community employment agencies as well, 
they often have their own job boards. Um, they're not always accessible right online, but if you connect with any local employment agencies, they'll often share postings on their boards if you send them over to them. Um, we have found lots of success in Peterborough with EPC, um, same with VCCS employers in Lindsay area as well. Um, so if you look those up, usually they're more than willing to help share out and get the word out to people in the community. Okay. Sorry, one second here. So getting involved in the community. Um, I wanted to highlight a little bit more for what's worked for us going out into the community. I had mentioned it on the last slide. So we had hosted a couple of virtual open houses back in 2021. Like many of you, you probably thought, how the heck can we connect in person when we can't be together in person? And so that was something that we really struggled with. We're a relationship-based organization and we like going out into spaces. So one thing that we had uh, brainstormed within our HR team was hosting a virtual open house on Zoom. And we shared this out with all the post-secondary schools in our area, um, any community partners we had, and then also sharing it out on social media. So we offered it out kind of like a drop-in where folks could come and join us and they could hear more about who we are as an organization, what career opportunities we have, and then also provide that opportunity for them to ask questions. Um, any questions they had for what we're looking for in staff, um, questions about what a day in the life of an educator looks like, et cetera. And then we did film the event as well so we could post it on our website and continue to share out. The other thing that I wanted to touch on was hosting our own in-house career fairs. Um, it's not necessarily a new idea, but it was something that we started to look at last year. One of our rural programs had reached out and they had this brilliant idea of really engaging the community space that they're in. Um, so they had started advocating out on social media, um, at any career spaces they had, such as community centers, um, public schools, et cetera. And we hosted a career fair right in Millbrook at our program. Um, and the event allowed us to bring people into the community to see our spaces, see where the children and educators are every day, and meet some of the educators, have a tour of the indoor and outdoor environments, and then have that opportunity to connect with us afterwards for career opportunities uh, that we had at that time as an organization. And we were really lucky. We ended up hiring a few folks from that. And um, two of the three that we did had ended up going to Fleming afterwards for ECE. Um, so that was something that we were quite proud of. And then going back with uh, community engagement, again, connecting with schools, I think that can be one of the most valuable relationships that we make. Um, we've been really lucky being so close to Fleming, connecting with them and ensuring opportunities out with staff and in postings about uh, opportunities where they could work full time and work towards their ECE at the same time. Okay. And then how to inspire people to apply to your organization. Your website can be a really great starting point. I am going to share here. Can everybody see that? Perfect. So we created a page on our career section on our website called Why Work With Us. And this allowed us the opportunity to share more about who we are as an organization, but also highlight connecting with um, not only current staff, but hopefully with potential new hires. So including lots of bright images, pictures of educators and children, we were able to include our total person compensation rate on the website. So again, taking away the mystery of what could people receive and, and be transparent in your approaches. Um, and then we also included some videos that we had of staff speaking to their experiences and then including staff accolades. Staff accolades and staff testimonials can be really, really important in getting the word out. Um, when we look at word of mouth or when we look at um, how can we recruit new hires, oftentimes that can come from making those connections with the folks who are already in your organization um, and making those easily accessible as well. So not only do we put these on our websites, but we also connect them to our job postings. Um, we've brought them with us to career fairs. We've shouted them out on social media as well. Um, so staff testimonials I talked about. Word of mouth, again, getting out into the community and having that community engagement within your uh, organization. Um, social media, having a space where you can engage with folks who you might not always get the chance to engage in, sharing about your organization, sharing what you're doing, sharing what your goals are, what you're striving for, sharing what a day in the life could look like at your program. 
people are moving and gravitating more towards social media. So really trying to use it to the best of your advantage. Um, and then values and culture and vision and mission. People often look for career, for career opportunities and for organizations where they can see themselves connecting with their personal values. So really highlighting that, highlighting your values, highlighting what you can offer for staff, not just that compensation piece, but the culture piece. Um, applicants will feel more compelled if they, they see you celebrating the people that you already have within your organization. Um, and sharing culture, again, staff accolades is a great way to do this, but also embedding it right in the recruitment process and involving everyone, including the children. And that's an example that we have up here on the screen, one of our programs had posed out to the children at their program and said, what can we do to help recruit educators? And those children ended up creating some really gorgeous and lovely uh, posters for us here that we've been able to share out. And it's opened up this whole idea of where can we take this now? Um, so bringing it back to the, the children and, and asking them, what do you look for in an educator? And what are qualities that you hope to see in people who are coming to join us? Um, and then again, that whole person compensation, really highlighting that. Um, and really making sure that, um, that we're recognizing everyone and their hard work within the field. Hi there. Uh, just to go back what um, Ryan had mentioned in regards to um, what inspires people to apply to our organization, um, we really um, want to align our practice of hiring, uh, interviewing, and onboarding um, with our values and, and the culture that we want. So I've added this quote in here um, by Maya Angelou. Uh, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And so the culture um, that we want to create um, is how people, how we want people to feel at the organization. So right from the beginning, um, the interview process, the invitation when we have people apply to uh, the organization, um, it's the first point of contact reaching out to them and really creating this excitement and welcoming atmosphere of we're so excited that you have applied to join our team. Uh, we can't wait to meet you. Um, so that is the initial contact of inviting them in for the interview. We then um, send out the questions. We send the questions out to our candidates and, and some people are like, wow, you're giving us the questions ahead of time. And the reason that we do this is we want to set people up for success. And our questions aren't skill testing questions. There are questions that are aligned with our values and about people's experiences and their story. Um, and uh, people bring the answer, they've gone through the questions and bring them with them. And we say, yeah, have them in front of you. Um, so it's really important to, um, for us to share those questions so that people have them ahead of time and can really share their story and be authentic. Um, and then our interview process, um, when people, when we invite them to come in, um, obviously things had changed through COVID and we're just getting back to uh, in-person interviews. Um, the interview team is made up of people that will be working with um, with this person or with these people. Um, and um, it is basically set up as a discussion. So the questions that we give out ahead of time um, guide our discussion. And we also ask for our um, candidates to bring questions with them because we love to be interviewed as well. Um, and then uh, sometimes we do have second interviews um, if we want other people to get to know them um, and then sometimes we have practical parts of interviews. It depends what kind of role that they're interviewing for. And then with our supply staff, um, the interview process that we go through is a, is a group interview. Um, and it aligns with our value of collective intelligence. And um, the experience that they get is, um, it's not necessarily a competition. It is, um, for um, people to think together, we read a story together, have reflective questions, we get to know each other. And then at the end of that interview, they actually write themselves a reference on how um, they will be a great addition to this organization. 
So from the interview process, then we go on to orientation. And so um, this, this picture shows um, back in the day when we were all together and did group interviews. Now it is online currently, and we are moving towards in person again, which is so exciting. Um, so our group orientation, uh, we really um, know that um, people are important to us. Relationships are important to us um, that we're called the human relations team. So, um, and uh, with the group interview, we started off with getting to know one another. So we make it fun. We really want to know people who they are. And as Ryan mentioned before, bring their authentic selves bring their whole selves to work. So we start off and I can give you an example. We ask a question about, um, you know, what would be your favorite karaoke song? If you were to sing karaoke and, and the answers that we get are great. And we've actually compiled a Compass new employee karaoke list, <laughs> which is great. Um, so we start off with values and culture. We dig into that. And then there's also the business part of, um, which we know is important, yet we want to focus on the people versus paper. Um, so the, the policy part and, and that we do the second day. We've, we've broke it down to two days now. We used to do it all in one day. And we know time is important. I just want to speak a little bit about time too. We're everyone's in a crunch to hire and we need, you know, we're hearing from programs. We need someone, we need someone. And we, as a human relations team, we had to say, yeah, it's really important that we have people. Um, and it's also really important to us that we give new employees the time. Um, so they really get to know us. Um, and then um, from the group interview, then we have on-site interviews as well, or sorry, on-site orientations as well, um, where they go into program um, and they have someone to welcome them at the program. And, um, you know, they show them where their coat goes. They say, you know, give them a tour of the center. Um, we want to parallel our practice. Um, what we want for children, we want for each other. And so how do we welcome children is how we want to welcome new employees. Uh, we want to honor who, um, who people are. We want to know them full well, just like we would with, with children. Um, and then um, we really want to honor people's strengths. Um, we, we practice a um, distributed leadership model where we see everyone in the organization as a leader, where um, they can um, work into their passions, their strengths, um, the way that we welcome people. We welcome them through um, not only at the center, but as an organization through the newsletter, through social media. Um, we have different networks within the organization um, that um, you know people may be passionate about. Um, uh, health and safety. So we have a health and safety committee um, that people can join. We have networks within our organization. We have a pedagogical network. We have an admin network. We have a culture network. And these are um, a, a time for people to come together uh, like-minded and that they're passionate about it. Uh, we also have professional development. Um, and we really uh, live into the value of creating safe, caring, and joyful places. So people have um, psychological safety, emotional safety, and physical safety, and can be their, their true selves. Thanks, Jenny. So as you can see, we, um, we think about how we bring people into our organization right from the very beginning, from the first time that, we, um, that uh, they have a contact with our organization. So what makes them stay? In uh, early learning and childcare, we do have a we have a revolving door of of people coming into the the field and then and then going out again. Um, what we know is that money, wages, retirement benefits, and health benefits more than ever now uh, in the last ten years have increasingly become the number one thing that people stay at their jobs for. Um, and Alana and Sue are going to talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to focus on culture, respect, and appreciation, and how do we bring those into our organization? And what we know is that employees are, um, uh, don't tend to leave their job, they leave their supervisor. So at Compass, we really had to think about what are the conditions um, that we can create that can offer that that every person in our organization can offer up their best selves 
their talents and their strengths for the benefit of the organization's purpose and vision. So first of all, our organization's purpose and vision is developed collaboratively. As Jenny mentioned about our collective intelligence value, we take that really seriously. We do a lot of surveys, not really long surveys that people have to spend a lot of time at, but we do a lot of surveys to get a pulse of what's happening with, um, with the people in our organization and um, really directing us to the next steps. Um, one of the one of the people we do a lot of book studies um, uh, with reinventing organizations was a book that we that really inspired us to think about uh, distributed leadership and what we were uh, how we might implement that. Daniel Pink is another. Uh, he wrote a book called Drive, and he was another one that really inspired us to think about um, that. It's more than money that people that motivate people. And so looking at autonomy, mastery, and purpose, that people want autonomy in there. Um, and, and certainly distributed leadership helps us to, to create that for people. Um, giving them freedom and choice. Um, there's a story that um, Jenny and I uh, go out throughout our organization and do sessions on distributed leadership. And there was one staff who spoke up and said, okay, face it, Sheila. I'm not going to come into your office and tell you how to run this organization. And I said, absolutely not. And I'm not going to come into your um, classroom and tell you how to run your classroom. That's for you to do. You know that best. But we can think together about different perspectives. And, and uh, I can ask you questions. You can ask me questions. But yeah, we don't tell each other what to do. So I think that was, you know, that was a, a good clarifying question for us to think about. Um, thinking about mastery, really setting the conditions around um, that lifelong learning is really important to us. And what we have found is that the more professional learning that we put out, the more people come in and they, um, and because also our professional learning is done in a collaborative kind of way. We don't, uh, we don't call people together to just tell them uh, things. We come together to think together, to, um, to come up with solutions. Those, that, third, um, that third idea that is better than your idea and my idea, it's a third way of thinking about something that is, uh, creates a synergy. Uh, to move us forward. Um, thinking about feedback, Jenny and I have done a lot of sessions around giving and receiving feedback, such an important piece of our everyday communication style. And, um, and so starting with a script or a protocol, the FBI protocol is one um, by Kristen Hadid, uh, has a great uh, video on YouTube about it. Um, it's one where we, uh, uh, we ask the person if uh, we can give them feedback. Um, and it is, uh, I have this feeling about something, a behavior that you did and, um, and, and the impact that it made. Because if we don't share that impact with others, they don't know often about it. Um, doing our own performance review, so important. Um, we, we don't, um, Daniel Pink talks a lot too about extrinsic and intrinsic uh, factors in motivating people. So an extrinsic uh, factor is like the carrot and stick where you, know, you do something good, you get a carrot, you do something bad, you get a stick or you get punishment. And so moving away from that and thinking more about an intrinsic, which is much more last, long lasting, we want people to re really be reflective about the work that they're doing and really thinking about their own practice in terms of where do I want to be? What do I, you know, what do I dream? What does the perfect job look like? And, and how do I fit into that? And what's my responsibility and accountability as Ryan had mentioned before. Then we talk about the purpose. Um, and so it's so important for, for us, uh, for the organization. Does your organization have a common purpose? 
a vision statement that people can look at and, um, and that they understand that they're part of a, a bigger, um, uh, a bigger uh, vision of what could be in our world that we're not just coming to work every day and, um, and changing diapers and feeding children. We're actually changing the world. We're making the world a better place by the interactions and the caring and the love that we give those children um, and making a contribution. Demonstrating respect. This has to happen every single day in our organization. Advocacy is something that we take really seriously and we do over and over. I, um, we have to stand up for our people. We have to let them know um, that, that they matter, that we see them, and that we, um, that we can, um, that they're important. Um, and so this is one, uh, one event that we held uh, during COVID um, and we're in this together. It was, um, uh, we had signs that said um, childcare heroes. Uh, we had a over a hundred cars in the school parking, in this particular school parking lot. Um, and we did a parade around town um, to, um, to say our childcare educators are heroes and, and uh, that we wanted to highlight that. Yeah. Okay, and next, I just have some. Uh, again, demonstrating respect. Uh, Martha Friendly, uh, when she visited our program, told us that um, one of the, uh, her and Jane Beach had done a, a study about childcare quality years ago. And they had, uh, one of the things that came out on top was staff rooms staff rooms where our staff can, can come in uh, uh, and, and just be joyful, be quiet, be reflective. And um, oh, we lost the picture, there we go. Okay, and you can go on to the next one. And one of the things that we find in childcare is some of our spaces are very small. This is a hundred square feet where we have an office and the staff room, but it doesn't have to be ugly. <laughs> it doesn't, it, um, this, is, um, uh, this is a beautiful space where, uh, and the staff were the ones who created it. Um, next. next, and the other thing is we want staff to be able to come into that room and uh, to have a coffee, to have things available to them yeah, uh, with their comfort. The other piece that is so visible in our organizations, and I think we sometimes forget about, is our budgets. Uh, Joe Biden said, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. Such an important piece. Our staff, uh, this is part of our annual report for 2022, um, and it shows that 85% of all of our revenue went to staff wages and uh, provider wages. Such an important statement about an organization. Um, so building on our lessons learned, together we're better. Together, working with staff, working with the people within our organization who are really important to our success, um, asking them the questions. People, are, the people who are living with a dilemma are the best ones to solve it. Give them the time and space to do this. Think together and ask questions. Be grateful. Thank people for showing up. Thank them for standing up and thank them for being themselves. They'll thank you back. You don't have to do this alone and you shouldn't. Thanks, Compass team. I think it's my turn, so I'll just uh, share my screen here. I'm always so inspired after listening to you all speak, and I feel like you live, we often talk about uh, we need to care for educators so they can care for children, and I feel like those are the values that you live, and I'm just really grateful for everything you were able to share today. Um, is everyone able to see my slides there? Wonderful. So I'm going to talk a little bit about 
sort of moving away from the organizational level to the systems level and what we're doing in Ontario to advocate for a comprehensive ELCC workforce strategy that we hope will resolve some of the retention and recruitment uh, issues that we're experiencing and also move forward the profession in a really strong and robust way. I first want to situate myself. I'm joining today from the unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory, which is land colonially known as Ottawa. It's home to uh, many people from different First Nations, but also a growing uh, population of Inuit who are moving away from their homelands and joining us uh, in Ottawa. So, uh, what is going on provincially right now? This is sort of our take of the provincial context. What is the current moment that we're uh, situated in? So the Canada-wide system has begun to decouple parent fees and educator wages, but it has not yet moved us to a publicly and appropriately funded system. It has replaced revenue from parent fees with public money, but still relies on a mix of wage enhancements uh, to improve compensation. Ontario's new proposed funding formula is problematic in many ways, uh, but it does at the very least recognize that funding should be connected to the cost of delivering ELCC services. The funding formula proposes, however, that the status quo and minimum regulations related to the workforce are sufficient, which we think they're not sufficient. Uh, provincial initiatives up to this point to address the workforce crisis have largely missed the mark and have not really gotten to the root causes. We can see this with the war, uh, wage floor approach, which is very slowly, uh, incrementally increasing only the floor of wages in our province. So what does this context provide us? What's the opportunity at hand and what's the strategy that we see? So without a doubt, the increase in public investment is an opportunity for us to articulate the real cost of operating ELCC programs and addressing the retention crisis is absolutely critical for the federal and provincial governments to meet their expansion targets. ECEs have been clear that wages and working conditions are the primary deterrent from the field. They are not the only reasons, but they are sort of the first hole in the leaky bucket that we need to plug if we're going to be able to address retention uh, and reattract educators back to uh, the profession. And we know the sector is committed to working within the Canada-wide system, but it's been administratively burdensome. Um, and really, we're feeling that burnout all across the province right now. Based on this opportunity, we really feel, as always, that, you know, it, it's calling us to work collaboratively, to do consensus building work, and for collective action. It shouldn't be up to just individual operators to do the best they can in a broken system anymore. We have to come together and advocate for the kind of system that allows everyone to experience decent work and professional wages across the province. And in order to do that, we need to present a transformational and well-articulated vision of the future of ELCC and the conditions required for ECEs to be well-supported, to engage in complex pedagogical and caring work with children and families and communities. So our strategy is really focused on advocacy at the provincial level with our national partners and cross-jurisdictionally with our allies across Canada to develop a comprehensive workforce strategy to hold our governments to account and to make sure that all educators are experiencing uh, the decent work that they deserve. So what's needed to really stabilize the sector and envision the future? Uh, right now, we have a lack of decent work. There's no lack of jobs. There's a lack of uh, good jobs and a lack of funding and system supports to make those good jobs possible. The $19 an hour wage floor is insufficient. There's a lack of benefits and pensions and challenging working conditions, no matter where folks are working. So the first thing we need to do is stabilize the sector. And from our perspective, that requires an immediate investment to raise wages, uh, so that we can retain our staff, reattract back staff that's left, and reattract the next generation of professionals. So we've uh, been calling for a $25 an hour start or a $30 start for RECEs, a wage scale that really recognizes folks' uh, levels of qualifications and their time in the sector. 
Uh, we don't want to see a wage scale that comes into the sector and, and people are then making less money than they were before. And we don't want to see anyone left out either. And we need an immediate increase of benefits access and access to pensions as well. But this is just sort of the first step from our perspective. And what we've really been focusing on um, is what's the goal? What is the future of the profession and where do we need to end up? Because certainly just an increase to wages right now isn't good enough. It's not going to take us forward into the future. So we've been thinking about a salary scale that aligns with levels of qualifications, that incentivizes increased qualifications, that defines job roles, establishes a career ladder, and recognizes professional learning. So where we are now is playing catch up from decades of chronic underfunding. Next, we need an immediate increase to re retain and reattract. And the goal is a well-supported and well-compensated professional who can lead us into the future. So we've been working on a wage grid policy brief and discussion paper. And we've been doing this collaboratively with our partners at the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care and other partners across the province. We've done substantial consultation over the past few years to really help understand not just where do we need to go tomorrow, but what do we need in the future? And so we've, uh, and I'll share with you that this is a draft. The uh, full report should be published by the end of June. So I appreciate you all understanding that the language may shift a little, things may change, but it's still in the works. But the principles that we think really need to be the foundation of a wage grid for our sector is that an understanding that funding the workforce is funding quality. There's absolutely no separating the two elements. The wage grid needs to be uh, found, founded on decent compensation for all, not just RECEs, everybody working in our field, unqualified staff, program staff, leadership, everyone needs to be included. They need to see themselves in this. We need a recognition of qualifications. We need recognition of experience. And this just isn't years of experience in the sector, but we're also thinking about um, experience that folks bring with them. And Sheila, I'm reminded what you said about seeing the whole, the whole person, right? Are you a French, French language speaker? Um, are you an indigenous language speaker? How is that an asset to the workplace? And how is that um, compensated? in a, a wage scale? How do we acknowledge the different experiences that people bring beyond just their qualifications or years in the field? We also need a recognition of responsibilities. What is the work that early childhood educators are really doing? How do we understand that? And how are we ensuring that folks are appropriately compensated for that work? We also need a wage grid that sets provincial standards for wages. This doesn't mean that there can't be regional differences based on cost of living, but that every early childhood educator across the province should make the same wage. They should be professionally paid no matter where they work. And we need equity across the ELCC sector. So while I'm talking a lot right now about childcare specifically, we know that that's not the full scope. In fact, childcare under the countywide system is still only a portion of what we understand when we talk about the childcare system. So how can this wage grid be building out to think about early childhood educators who work in newcomer support programs, which are federally funded? How are we making sure that those working in First Nations are also <laughs> professionally paid for their work. So it needs to be broader than just thinking about licensed childcare in this moment. And it needs to be founded on a democratic process that centers the voices of educators. Like Sheila said, if you have a problem, chances are the folks who are living that problem have the best understanding of how to fix the problem. And to that extent, the process we believe we need to take to get to this visionary <laughs> wage grid, salary get grid for our future, is through a collaborative, democratic, and transparent system that includes job evaluation and ongoing engagement with ECEs and the sector. Alongside this work, we're also thinking about uh, decent work conditions. And uh, we've been drafting an early childhood sector decent work, work standards document for quite a number of years. It emerged in 2018 from our decent work task force at the time as a checklist for operators. But given the context now, we're reworking it again with our decent work common table uh, to try to operationalize 
What does decent work mean in ELCC? What does this look like in a budget? How can governments ensure that every program has what they need to provide decent work conditions for early childhood educators? So a few of the categories that we're working through in this document, uh, which we're adapting from the Ontario Nonprofits Decent Work Checklist, you'll see on the screen here, and I won't talk about them in detail because I want to get over to Sue in a moment, but within these, there's a number of indicators that we're using to help articulate, again, what does this look like, how can we cost it out, uh, and what does it mean for governments and the real cost of ELCC programs. And again, just a reminder here that educators' working conditions are children's learning conditions. Those two cannot be separated. So funding to ensure decent work for early childhood educators ensures better learning and care for uh, children. And finally, uh, an invitation to connect with us and engage with this work. We have a Provincial Day of Action and Hope <laughs> uh, coming on June 20th. Uh, and we just had a wonderful planning session on Tuesday. Sheila was there and, and Sheila's questions have inspired part of the focus of this Day of Action. Um, so we'll have provincial and local actions happening, uh, we'll have toolkits and trainings, and our hope is that we can engage ECE's children, families, and operators to wonder what is true now, what is also true, and what could be, and use those messages to inspire us to continue to advocate for change and inspire our governments to respond to the change that the sector says it needs. So I invite you to reach out. My information is on the slide, as is my colleague, Carolyn, from the coalition. And we're always happy to talk, share our work, and engage with you all. So thank you very much for giving me the space to share. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, oh, right. That was fantastic, Alana. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, uh, I, 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 you know, it's it. You covered so much that um, there's not much left for me to say. Really, I'm I'm just trying to situate the issues of compensation within the context of expansion because expansion is what B two C two is really all about. And I think we've become very aware in the last six months, just as you say, Alana, that really, I mean, I know we've been aware for 40 years. I mean, I go back, I can, I can think back to that document that was done by the Sector Council in 1997, which is 25 years ago. And it was called from a recognition to, um, to, to compensation. And basically it was saying, well, it was actually from compensation to re recognition. And back then, 25 years ago, there was a huge recognition that we need, um, we need to value much more the work of early childhood educators if we're going to have any kind of system at all, let alone an expanded one. So that was really fantastic and I'm, um, I'm sure we'll be really happy in B2C2 to work alongside you to make, um, you know, make, make, to discuss your document when it comes out. Um, I'm just gonna put up a few sc screens. There's hardly any streets, what do you call them, slides. I hardly have any, because I, I, I knew you were gonna say all these wonderful things. Um, but, oh, here, here it is, I think. Oh yeah, um, that's right. Um, as, as everyone said, I think the three key things are that it's time to, for, for early childhood educators to get paid what they're worth. It's time for us to determine what, what you're worth. And it's also time to figure out how you're actually going to get. So we have put some on our website, you'll see, we have put some some sample wage grids up because we think it's really important that people begin to realize that we come away from this system where we have had to base uh, we've had to base our funding and our budgets on parent fees now we are moving into a situation where governments are going to be funding about 85 to 90 percent of the service 
which includes wages. So for the first time, it, it doesn't mean that, that, that every time the wages rise, the, the parent fees rise and everybody feels badly, or you might be threatening the um, existence of the childcare because of the fact that the parents will leave and so on and so forth. And in fact, I was talking to a colleague of mine the other night from the PAEC, who's worked in pay, Equal Pay Coalition for years and years and years. And she was saying that one of the big problems with childcare was that when we, when we did establish pay equity, a lot of programs could not afford to be able to raise the, the, uh, the wages to the comparator that they found um, for pay equity purposes. Well, I think maybe it's time for us to start thinking about pay equity again, actually, because um, um, now that the government is going to be paying, and I agree, Alana, we're not quite there, but we're talking about a year and a half to two years, by which time the government will be paying 85%. So it, it kind of makes sense that, um, that we're going to get there soon. So the wage, uh, so uh, on, I just wanted to say that on our website, I can't get these working anyway. On our website, I put up um, um, a couple, of, here we go. This is uh, the, the community college um, ECEs and assistance as of March, 2022. So that's a year old now. And already, if you've been working in a community college as, a, as an RECE, you would have been making $38.37 an hour. Plus, you would have had a, a, a huge range of benefits and you'd have been part of a, of a province-wide province pension plan. And you would have got these wages no matter where you worked in the province of, um, of Ontario, actually, because the, the community colleges, this particular, um, occupation is is province wide, um, so I just I just think it's it you know it, we've been in this I mean when you think about the nineteen dollars an hour wage floor that the province has been imposing, I mean quite honestly the minimum wage this year is going up fifty cents more or fifty five cents more than the childcare uh, than than their suggestion for a child. So the minimum wage is going up fifteen fifty to six fifty five in October, uh, which is more than, than um well it's not quite more is it it's, but it's a, but it's we're only we're they're expecting a, a people to to accept the idea that only an only one dollar an hour is going to be sufficient to keep them in the field. So um uh, on the website also you will see that there's some comparative um. Uh, there's some screens with some comparative um, um, uh, other other occupations and comparative um, uh, wage grids that show you also. And the interesting thing about all of these wage grids is that it, they, they get these wages that are so much higher than most childcare centers in the rest of the province get because they're government funded. Now, isn't this interesting? Because before we were these nonprofit organizations that were dependent on parent fees. And now when we're moving into a period of being government funded, there is a real opportunity to be able to look at uh, levels of wages that actually represent what ECEs are worth. So then um, uh, I have another slide here that shows uh, um, a piece of work, a, a selection from a piece of work that Gord Cleveland did, which is basically showing, and, and you can get this on his website, which somebody maybe can put the, um, the URL up, but it basically shows that ECEs are getting the wages paid to high school student graduates, whereas people who, the people who are, have the equivalent qualifications, i.e., um, uh, community college diplomas, two years diplomas, are, are getting a, a significantly more than um, than is being paid at the same rate. This, but I think it's also important for people to realize that they can dream 
and they can um, feel that um, that that there's that there's much more to it than just being able to have one or two dollar increase a year. If we actually went through a proper job evaluation process, where we actually took into account the qualifications, the level of effort, the responsibilities, and the working conditions, which is those sort of components of, of uh, job evaluation, then we would be able to say, okay, if we compare all of those four things to other workers in, 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 in a municipality, for example, or a community college or a hospital, so then the question is how, um, I'm, I'm saying all this because I know that um, having talked to the college this week, they, they've got 23,000, they think there are about 23,000 RECEs left uh, childcare centres, but might be willing, you know, a potential pool of people to come back to the profession if it was, if, 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 if they felt they were being really regarded as being, uh, being worth, being respected and being honoured and being, and being, and, and being treated as worth what they really are. So, um, as you know, the government is already aware of this problem. The, min the uh, provincial government and the federal government are really saying, yes, we know this is a problem. And it's taken a long time, I think, for, for that recognition. Um, uh, and in fact, the college was saying that they've turned, because, because the government's been saying it's recruitment and retention. Well, now um, a lot of people are turning around and saying, no, First, we've got to retain before we can, re we, uh, you know, we can go on to recruit. So that's that's um, a really important aspect of it, I think. Um, yeah. So governments are already aware, but we have to, I think, just keep making them aware, because it's if you don't keep making them aware, then we're not going to get what's needed. We're going to get get a, a, a really weak wage scale, and we're going to get a really weak level of increase so hopefully everybody can go out and and remind their municipalities because municipalities are do do have a voice with the government and so that's a good good way to actually be heard so municipalities and um mpps tell them all that um we that that you really want ecs to be um paid the right amount to be paid what they're worth, I think is what I say. Thanks very much. And and okay, so we're at the end of this. Yes, yes Tara. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, all the speakers. Uh, we can have a few questions. We've got a few minutes. Um, we did get a few questions in the chat. Um, as people were asking, that I think Carolyn Ferns um, actually addressed to a certain to a certain point. But um, we had: is this the proposal that all of Ontario childcare centres follow? And I think that one was uh, for you, Elena. And also, do you see a large difference between the private and public sectors? Shall I hop in? Yes, I can, sure. Uh, so. At this point, what we're working on in terms of the um, decent work standards is something that we are planning to use as an advocacy tool. We we know under the current financial situation, much of what we're recommending in this is not possible, right? Non-contact time, paid professional learning, programs require appropriate funding to be able to offer that to all of their staff. So we recognize it's not as simple as us saying, this is what all programs should do, and then all programs go and do it. So we're using it as a tool to help governments understand what it is we're talking about and how much money it costs to provide these standards across the province. Um, and in terms of public and nonprofit, I'm sure someone can comment. There's been, I think, you know, substantial data and research done into uh, wages and working conditions between the two that does demonstrate that often nonprofit and uh, publicly operated childcare does have higher wages um, and better working conditions. So I'll leave it to there if anyone else wants to jump in. And
Does anyone else want to say anything about that? Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? There are, are a lot of you here, so um, feel free to step in. Sue, do you have anything to add? Oh, here we go. Strategies include joining childcare organizations. Oh, this is Jamie Cass. Uh, strategies include joining childcare organizations as individuals and centers, join days of action and advocacy initiatives, and unionizing is also an, imp an important if we will make is important if we will make real gains. Any comments on that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, well, I just think that the meeting is starting right now. Okay. All right. Um, I I just wanted to say that the um uh the problem of um because it's not a unionized sector, I think it also means that operators have to take some responsibility because the, the um, there is going to be a federal provincial um, ministers meeting about the workforce this summer in June or July. And they are gonna discuss, they're talking about a, um, a, multi, um, a multi service agreement. So that might mean money. So it's, it's really important that operators, not just um, um, the unions also start, start to make governments aware that more money is needed for wages and operating and, and operating decent programs. So that means that the funding formula that they just put out has to be changed. I mean, you know, and all the recommendations that have been put forward around that, I think it'd be really good because people have been saying, no, nah, it's not good enough. It's not gonna achieve what we need in terms of high quality childcare. Okay, so we had one other question. Is there any information about pension plans? I might ask back what kind of um, information. It's certainly something that we're making recommendations about. Um, but if it might be helpful to understand what kind of information you're looking for. Well, maybe it's time to set up um, a province-wide childcare um, uh, pension plan, just like, you know, municipal workers have pension plans and community college workers have pension plans. Maybe it is time to set up a, um, a um, you know, a, a pension plan for childcare. Or else to add on to, like OMA's is a big municipal pension plan. Maybe um, people should be starting to think about and maybe... There should be a committee to think about this province-wide. How do we actually add childcare workers to pension plans? Otherwise, everybody's going to go off and do their own, you know, little thing. Or they'll all get RSP, amounts for their RSP, right? And it won't be quite the same. So it's, it's a good question and something that um, there needs to be thought about, I think. Okay, so um, there are some answers in the chat, and unfortunately, my chat is bouncing around all over the place, and so <laughs> it's a little bit difficult to read, um, and hopefully I'm not missing anything, uh, but I, I think we, we're pretty much done with the question, so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone uh, for coming. Uh, we do have two more uh, workshops in our series, uh, one uh, next Friday. No, sorry, three more workshops in our series, one next Friday and then the fr two Fridays after. So um, we'd love to see you there. All of the workshops are free and uh, you can sign up on our website at b2c2.ca slash workshops. And I also wanted to thank all of the speakers for giving us their time and their expertise. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll see you again at one of our workshops too. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm.